wrestling world in shock today. Former champion Chris Benoit found dead in his Atlanta home along with his wife and young son. Police now treating the discovery as a double murder-suicide. Wrestling can be a very demanding force. With that demanding force comes lots of bumps. People say wrestling is fake, but the damage it can do to a person is significant. This story I'm about to tell led to the deaths of Nancy Benoit and her seven-year-old son, Daniel Benoit. She was betrayed and suffered in her last moments of her precious life. Remember when people said that wrestling was fake? Nancy Elizabeth Tofaloni was born on May 17, 1964 in Boston, Massachusetts. She was born to one other sibling, her sister Sandra Tofaloni. According to friends and family, especially Sandra, Nancy was known as a delightful woman who would help others before helping herself. She would always support her friends and family and would always offer a helping hand for those who needed it. Nancy moved sometime to Florida where she graduated from D-Land High School in Jacksonville being the class of 1981. As soon as Nancy graduated, she picked up a job at State Farm picking up phone calls. During this time, she was also a model, doing photo shoots on the side of her State Farm job alongside her then-husband, Jim Doss. That's when George Napolitano needed a beautiful young girl for the cover of his June 1984 edition of the pro wrestling magazine, Wrestling All-Stars. Fellow photographer Bill Oden suggested the then 20-year-old Nancy to be on the cover. Nancy also had another side hustle, selling programs for wrestling, as she became a fan of wrestling after attending her first live show. For these programs, she appeared as a personality named Para for Apartment Wrestling. It was at one of these programs where she met a man by the name of Kevin Sullivan. Kevin saw Nancy and wanted her to be a part of his own wrestling entourage. Nancy took several months on deciding if she should go through with it. Eventually, Kevin convinced Nancy to come and she became an on-air valet for him, debuting on Florida Championship Wrestling on June 30th, 1984 as a satanic personality by the name of Fallen Angel. Her and Kevin were in a group with legendary wrestlers like Luna Vichon and the Purple Haze, causing a ruckus with the fans, some of them believing that they were Satanists in real life. Nancy did not shy away from this gimmick, playing the role perfectly in and outside of the ring. It was at this moment in her life where Kevin and Nancy fell in love. She soon divorced Jim in 1984 and married Kevin a year later. Her career was only just beginning. In 1989, Tofaloni debuted on WCW, also known as World Championship Wrestling, posing as a fan of Rick Steiner by the name of Robin Green, covering herself with sunglasses and wearing merchandise of Steiner's. She would always be in the crowd, interacting with Rick every time he came out to the ring. She later turned on him and joined Kevin Sullivan, adopting a new name, the legendary name, Woman. It was with this character that she became a manager to Kevin until he decided to leave the company in 1990. She managed a duo of Butch Reed and Don Simmons, known as Doom, and also managed Ric Flair and the rest of the Four Horsemen. Nancy left in 1990 as well and took a three-year hiatus from wrestling management. She later debuted on ECW, also known as Extreme Championship Wrestling, with her husband and reinvented her character Woman and had her first and only match on May 14, 1994 alongside legendary wrestler Tommy Dreamer versus Peaches and the Sandman after having a rivalry since March, where unfortunately she would lose this match. She later managed for numerous wrestlers in that company from November 1994 through December of 1995 until leaving. Woman made her re-debut on WCW on the next month, January 22, 1996, on Monday Night Nitro, alongside Macho Man Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan waving at the crowd. On February 5th, she turned on Savage and aligning herself with the reinvented Four Horsemen, which included a hard-working wrestler by the name of Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit was a wrestler at WCW at the time who worked almost non-stop to perfect his skills in the ring. By 1996, he was in an on-air feud with Kevin Sullivan, with Woman being on Kevin's side. 
Kevin was one of the creative writers for WCW at the time, and he wanted his wife to fake a relationship on TV with Chris Benoit for show. At first, she didn't know if she wanted to go through with it, but after convincing her, she took the role and became Chris's on-air girlfriend. This was also off-air as they would pretend to be in a relationship in front of the fans and trash-talking Sullivan for show. Unfortunately for Kevin, Nancy and Chris Benoit started to fall in love slowly and started an extramarital affair, which people made jokes that Kevin booked the storyline of his real-life divorce. Both Nancy and Chris were married at the time they met and started the affair. Chris divorced his wife, Nancy divorced Kevin. It was here where Nancy and Chris began to blossom into a serious and intense relationship. Earlier, it was implied that Chris was a perfectionist. He was always dissatisfied with how he performed in the ring and wanted to do the absolute best. He never thought that he was better than anyone. He was his own competition. Chris's father disliked the idea of his son becoming a wrestler and till this day blames himself for his son's death. Chris took wrestling seriously, maybe too seriously, as he did not care for his own mental stability or mental health. He was constantly taking steroids as he was seen as the little guy in the business where most of the top wrestlers in the 1990s were more muscular. Some of them were taking steroids as well, which was and still is a problem with sports, even including the Olympics where a few people tested positive for growth hormones in the past. On top of steroids, Chris had a wrestling finisher by the name of the Flying Headbutt, which ultimately caused major issues to his brain over seven years of hitting his head on someone's chest from a significant distance. Daniel Christopher Benoit was born on February 25th, 2000, and Nancy officially married Chris on November 23rd, 2000. It seemed that Nancy, Chris, Daniel, and David, who was Chris's son from a previous marriage, were in a big, happy family, and Chris, Nancy, and Daniel moved to Atlanta, Georgia. But that didn't last very long. In May of 2003, Nancy decided she wanted to leave Chris and filed for divorce due to cruel treatment. She later reconciled with Chris and decided not to go through with the divorce and the restraining order she had on him was also dropped in August of that year. Again, things seemed fine after that. It seemed that Chris was flourishing in his career now in WWE alongside his best friend, Eddie Guerrero. However, soon, things spiraled out of control and the horror storm was starting to cast over Nancy's life. In November of 2005, Chris lost someone extremely close to him. Eddie Guerrero's heart stopped in a hotel room in Minnesota after a wrestling match. Eddie was pronounced dead at the scene as he died of heart disease. Eddie used to be an extreme pill addict and was also taking steroids. According to his wife and widow, Vicky Guerrero, Eddie overdosed on drugs a total of three times. The first two times, she panicked and she was there for him. But his addiction was too much for Vicky to bear, and to take care of their children, taking care of their home, and stressed out about her husband. The third time he overdosed, she just took her children and left them on the couch. You know, I saw Chris several different times to make sure that Eddie was tucked in bed okay, you know, and put on his side so he wouldn't throw up on himself. But then Eddie started getting DUIs, crashing his car, and, you know, having overdose problems. There was three ODs that Eddie did in our house. The first two, I called the ambulance. And all they did was release him the next afternoon. They, they just sent him home. The third time, I, I just let him lay there. I actually left him to the girls at school and just told God, if you're gonna take him, just take him now because it was a bad place in my life. She felt that Eddie did not want to get help for his issues. She also wanted to help her husband, but only those who want help will actually get it. Which was exactly what Eddie decided to do after the third overdose. He got fired from WWE, then decided to work on himself, his addiction, and eventually overcame it. 
He later got rehired to WWE, and both Eddie and Chris won titles at the same time. Chris won the World Heavyweight Championship, and Eddie won the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 20, both celebrating together, hugging, with confetti falling on top of them. Eddie's heart gave out. We don't know why it gave out. It could have been the drugs, it could have been the steroids he was taking, but it also could have been a pre-existing condition that he had. I'm not too sure about what transpired with his heart deciding to stop. He was only 38 when he died, so I personally do not know what contributed exactly to his heart no longer beating. This was someone who Chris was so close with for over two decades, someone he confided in, someone he loved and kept closely to his heart. It was at this time when Eddie's heart gave out. Chris lost all control of the mental stability he never even cared enough about to get treatment until it was too late. After this, Chris shut down. He stopped speaking to Nancy for months at a time. She would ask what was wrong with him and he would go into a rage. People stated it was some sort of steroid rage. There are numerous factors of Chris's anger. Yes, steroids may have played a part into his anger. However, with numerous bumps to the head from chair shots, flying headbutts for decades, falling off of ladders and chairs, wrestling is staged, but the injuries are real and I will dive in on his condition of his brain later on. Chris's anger increased over time. He cried for several hours at a time because of Eddie's death. Vicky stated that Chris would cry for hours on her bed, lying on Eddie's side and holding his pillow. Eddie's death was a travesty, especially to Chris. His anger just grew, his pain grew, and his depression got severe. Even with a journal in hand, writing to Eddie as if he were alive, he was still not okay. Oh, Eddie. I forgot to tell you about my dream last night. I dreamt that both of my parents were taken, perished. Mike Benoit believes it's the diary of his son going mad. And Nancy and I were trying to get to her parents in Daytona to save them because we felt that they were being taken next. And these people after them were very powerful people, high-ranking people. When we got to Daytona, it was too late. Her parents were gone too, perished. We just didn't understand this was going on at that time in, in Chris's life. Nancy thought the journal would help, but it did for some time. But for someone who didn't want to speak to a therapist, for someone who did not have any thoughts besides wrestling and being his own personal best, the bomb would tick only for so long. And it was on June 22nd, 2007, that Chris finally lost all sense of control. Chris and Nancy were arguing as it was increasing since November 2005. Nancy was always a supportive person and wanted to help Chris as much as she could. She was claiming that he was abusive towards her, but she still wanted to try to figure out what was truly wrong with Chris. She unfortunately did not know what was going to happen to her. While they were fighting, Chris took a cord, possibly a telephone cord, grabbed Nancy, wrapped a cord around her neck, and pulled severely. He sat on top of her back and pressed his knee so hard that she suffered from a broken back while being strangled to death. He strangled her until he knew she was dead. He left the room, went and got a Bible, and placed it next to his wife's body. Atlanta police later confirmed this as Nancy's back was bruised, consistent with a knee to the back and her fractured spine. Nancy also had three different drugs in her system at the time of death, Xanax, hydrocodone, and hydromorphine, all of which were found at therapeutic levels rather than toxic levels. After he killed Nancy, he turned on their seven-year-old son, Daniel. He drugged Daniel with Xanax and choked his son with his bare hands. There was no struggle, no bruises on him, but there were marks to his throat, supporting him being asphyxiated with a choke. Little Daniel also had a Bible next to his body, and there was also a knife found on the floor next to his bed. He killed Nancy on Friday, killed Daniel on Saturday, but stayed in the house and lingered. Chavo Guerrero, the nephew of Eddie and former WWE wrestler, received a very odd text from both Chris's phone and Nancy's phone on Sunday. 
Chavo claimed both those texts came almost at the same time, and Dean Malenko also received the same exact texts. But before he got those texts, the last time he spoke to Chris was a few days ago. He claimed Nancy and Daniel were sick with food poisoning and that he was fine. He told Chavo he loved him twice, stating, I love you, Chavo. You know I love you. Those texts on Sunday read, The dogs are in the enclosed pool area and the back door is open. Chavo thought it was weird, but didn't think anything significant and went to go pick up Chris at the airport for a WWE Vengeance pay-per-view where Chris was supposed to wrestle CM Punk, but Chris did not show up. Chavo got extremely worried at this point because Chris never, ever missed a show. A welfare check was made for Chris by the WWE. On June 25th, 2007, the police knocked on the Benoit door. They were able to get inside the home, and that's where Nancy was first found, dead and lying on her stomach. It was obvious she suffered tremendously while being murdered. They then found her son Daniel dead in his bed with those marks on his neck. They found the two dead. They immediately thought about Chris still being in the home. Police made their way into the home gym and found Chris. At first, deputies thought that Chris was still alive, as the mirror that was facing the door to the gym had Chris's reflection. The officer stated for Chris to put his hands up, but there was no movement. They soon entered and found Chris hanging from a rope on his weight machine. Chris tied the rope to the weights, almost 250 pounds worth of pressure, wrapped it around his neck, and released the machine. Benoit was found to have Xanax, hydrocodone, and an elevated level of testosterone, caused by a synthetic form of hormone in his system. It was a husband and father horrific betrayal, something that no one ever even thought of. Not one person claimed Chris to be violent or capable of murdering his own family. Only Nancy behind the scenes was stating that he was cruel to her. She also stated that he was abusive towards her. She claimed that there were good and bad moments, but not many people knew, only Sandra, her sister. Chris was very well liked and always quiet, kind, and kept to himself. He was very professional in and outside of the ring and never caused issues with anyone. No one believed that this was Chris Benoit's doing. And this is the healthy brain on the left, and you see a, a very smooth background here. You see normal brain cells and no abnormal staining at all, very, very consistent. Here we see a very small section of Chris's brain, and you see these brown areas here against a very, very striking uh, brown background here. And all of this area is staining for damaged brain cells. These are, are dead brain cells in their connection. And how much of this did you find? It was uh, uh, extensive throughout Chris's brain. It was striking and maybe shocking in, in the extent. Another, another uh, example that you have, another contrast you have, is the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. You have said that this mimics some of the things you see in Alzheimer's patients, even in this young man. Well, well it does exactly. And here, here you see an Alzheimer's patient, again, uh, a very uh, striking uptake of the brown dye. And this is a dye that you need to, to tell this protein, which indicates the previous damage. Chris's brain was later examined for untreated concussions and possible brain damage at the Sports Legacy Institute in 2008. It was found that Benoit had severe depression, CTE, a condition of brain damage from numerous concussions he had, and almost were all untreated. Julian Bales, the head of neurosurgery at West Virginia University, stated that Chris's brain was so damaged it was equivalent to an 85-year-old man with Alzheimer's. He was also reported to have an advanced form of dementia, similar to the brains of four different retired NFL players who had suffered multiple concussions, sank into depression, and harmed themselves or others. Chris's severe brain damage was a high possible contribute to the horrific crimes. They also found steroids in the home, and when asked by reporters if the steroids could have played any part in the murder-suicide, the DA, Scott Ballard, said, quote, we don't know yet. This is one of the things that we'll be looking at. And yet, almost immediately after, the WWE comes out with a statement saying steroids, quote, were not and could not be related to the cause of death. 
How could you possibly know that? The report, the toxicology reports are out. They're not going to come back for several weeks. So how can you so definitively say steroids played no part? Well, we didn't say that. And that's what we're... That's a quote. Well, I understand. And our reaction, by the way, was to reacting to the hysteria of the media, um, which quite naturally they want to get to the bottom of this as we do. But Mr. McSan, the quote is we're not and could, steroids were not and could not be related to the cause of death. That's very specific. It's very specific, but it's relating to the word rage because of the steroid rage uh, that everyone was using. And obviously this is not an act of rage. It's an act of deliberation when you do something like this over three days. It's not an act of rage, be it steroid rage or roid rage, whatever it's called, or any other rage. That's what we're referring to. WWE Chairman Vince McMahon made absolutely no contact to Nancy or Chris's family. David Benoit, who is now an adult, made it clear on the show Dark Side of the Ring that wrestlers Chavo Guerrero and Chris Jericho were the only two people to pass their condolences. Vince made appearances on TV trying to fend the media from their claims of roid wage within Chris. He chose a stance to not take responsibility, even though he allegedly allowed wrestlers to receive major head bumps, including with weapons and on the ring's turnbuckle, supposedly allowed his wrestlers to take performing enhancing drugs and made absolutely little effort to check on the physical and mental well-being of his wrestlers, which is all supported by court transcripts against Vince McMahon. Vince was acquitted of these charges but ultimately admitted to allowing wrestlers to take steroids and admitted to taking them himself. Chris also took pills that the WWE had no idea about and somehow passed his drug test for the company right before the murders were committed. How did Chris pass if he was taking medications and substances that he kept to himself? How do these tests work if people who are taking hydrocodone pass for a multi-billion dollar company? It didn't seem like it was being taken seriously as it should have been. Vince has not recently spoke on Chris Benoit, and the WWE does have an updated wellness policy for those who take drugs including pills not prescribed, cocaine, cannabis, and other illegal substances. WWE did step up their efforts, but only three lives had to be lost in such a brutal way for these policies to be strictly in place. Nancy was a wonderful person who put everyone over herself. She was a completely selfless woman who perfected her management craft, brought joy to people's lives, and made a huge mark on the wrestling managers alongside Miss Elizabeth. She was a driving force in wrestling and a beautiful soul. She was a devoted mother and took care of Daniel and treated David Benoit like her own son. Nancy Tofaloni will be dearly missed and deserves to be recognized within her legacy. Daniel was a happy, joyful little boy who deserved to grow up and experience what life is like, and he will never get the chance to do so. No child should be drugged and killed no matter the circumstance. Chris should have made the effort to treat his mental health early in his career. If you are suffering from domestic abuse, please go to thehotline.org for the National Domestic Hotline or call 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. And once you get to the website, you will see a little window where it tells you to press the escape key twice and you'll be redirected to a blank Google search page so if your abuser is nearby, they won't see what you're searching for. May Nancy Elizabeth Tofaloni and Daniel Christopher Benoit rest in peace.